So if you have your Bible, turn it to Matthew, the fourth chapter. Today I want to look at four verses right here in the beginning to set us up for this new series that we're going to be jumping into. But the Bible says in Matthew, the fourth chapter, verse one, then Jesus was led up by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Immediately after Jesus was baptized in water, the Spirit of God descended from heaven, rested on Jesus, and the Father spoke these words, This is my Son in whom I am well pleased. Right after that moment, the Spirit then ushers him into the wilderness where we find him right here in Matthew the fourth chapter, and while he's in the wilderness praying, while he's in the wilderness fasting, getting ready for his ministry, the devil shows up. How many of you know anytime you start doing something good, the devil's going to show up? I want to say that again. Anytime you start doing something good, the devil is going to show up. And, and right now, I know some of you are thinking, well, I'm just not going to do nothing good. <laughs> then he's already got you. <laughs> But anytime you start doing something good, the devil shows up. The good news is we have authority over the devil because of what Jesus Christ accomplished on the cross. So when he shows up, we don't have to walk in fear. We don't have to back down. We don't have to shake in our boots. All we got to do is stand our ground knowing that God is with us. God is for us. And the Bible teaches if we will resist, somebody say resist. Yes. If we will resist the devil... He will flee. Resist means to push back. Has anybody been to the gym ever before? I know you can't tell by looking at me, but I have been to the gym. Or at least I've held two gym memberships in my life, not saying that I went regularly. But I'll tell you this, when you get down on the bench press and you throw weight on there, there is a resistance. But that resistance builds your strength. And the more you push, the more strength you get the more breakthrough you see so when the enemy comes at you i want you to see it that way as a child of god when the enemy comes at you you've got to learn how to stand and resist knowing that it's producing strength and at some point in time you are going to see breakthrough how many of you are ready to see a breakthrough in your life well keep on pushing well when do i get to stop pushing pastor when you see the breakthrough and then as soon as you see breakthrough, get ready because another challenge is coming that you're going to have to push through. I've learned that about life. Life is a series of challenge and breakthrough. Challenge and breakthrough. But every challenge you go through that you overcome, you go to a new level. A new level of understanding. A new lever, level of strength. A new level of power so when the challenge comes don't look at it as something that's going to destroy you but look at it as an opportunity for God to move you to a new level amen that's what's happening with Jesus he's about to start his ministry on earth and as he's moving into this time of ministry the enemy shows up because he's wanting to back him down he's wanting to pull him out of his purpose so the Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil, verse 2. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. <laughs> and the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God. If you are the Son of God. Command these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus answered him, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. When Jesus was tempted by the devil, he immediately went to the word of God written in Deuteronomy, the eighth chapter, verse three, where he says, man shall not live by bread alone alone but by every word somebody say every word every word that comes from the mouth of God when I was younger I used to spend my summers at my father's church and uh, they, they either didn't have child labor laws back then or we just overlooked them 
but I was like the cleaning crew at my father's church during the summer. And every day I would have to like find somebody who would take me to lunch. And so I would go around to different employees trying to bum a ride. And I would always like make it like, uh, you know, not so much like, hey, will you take me to get some food? But more so like, hey, you want to hang out, go to lunch? And so I go to this guy and I asked him, I said, hey, you want to go to lunch today? And he looked at me in the eyes and he said, man shall not live by bread alone. And I said, I know, we need meat and cheese and vegetable and fruit. <laughs> you know, there's a food pyramid. I'd like to get all of them at some point today. But the point of this passage is not to diminish our need for food. How many of you understand you need food? Jesus has fasted for 40 days. He's actually hungry. We need food. So it's not to diminish our need for food, but to emphasize the importance of the Word of God in our life. Because just like bread feeds your body, the Word of God feeds your life. The same way that food nourishes you, the Word of God nourishes you. The same way that food satisfies your hunger, the Word of God satisfies your soul. Today we're starting a brand new series that I'm really excited about called Built to Last. Somebody say Built to Last. We want to talk about building a life that lasts, a life that stands when storms come. A life that has the ability to thrive when everything else is coming against them. I want you to understand that as children of God, we have the ability to thrive in every season. I want to say it again for those of you that didn't catch it. As children of God, we have the ability to thrive in every season. That doesn't mean that we will avoid the season, but we can thrive in the season. Why? Because like a tree planted by the rivers of living water, right? That's who we are. We are planted by the river of living water and it says we bear fruit in what every season so we're going to talk about building a life that lasts if you were born before 1990 how many of you born in the 1900s in here if you were born before 1990 you would probably agree with me that things aren't made the same way as they used to be made It's not made with the same quality or care. You know, like houses used to be built to stand forever. Now they just get thrown together. Paper thin walls. (laughs) Anybody experienced new construction lately? Why? Because it's just thrown together. It's not really built to last because in a few years you're going to go build another, you know, find another one, build somewhere else, and eventually they'll tear that down and put up a new development. Furniture doesn't have the same quality that it did growing up. I mean, my grandparents' generation, when they bought furniture, it was like there for their life. Like they didn't even take the plastic off of it because they knew that this is the couch that they're gonna breathe their final breath on. They took furniture buying more, expi- uh, more, more uh, uh, seriously, thank you, the marriage you know it's like this couch till death do us part yeah marriage it may fall apart but this couch will be here (laughs) my grandparents had a uh, barrel table with barrel chairs does anybody know what i'm talking about and as children we would play and roll around in these barrel chairs and never broke one of them my grandfather passed away 10 years ago he would be i think 105 years old now and that table to my knowledge, is still there. Why? Because it was built to last. I want us to build a life that lasts. I want us to build families and marriages that last. I want us to build a church that lasts. I remember growing up in the private school I went to, the church was celebrating 100 years. And most of you would think, man, that's amazing. But the only thing that has lasted with that church was the building because there were no people around. 
I don't want that to be the case for Activation Church. I want to develop something that will be here long after we are gone, that is still reaching the world with a mighty and powerful message of Jesus Christ. But that is very intentional. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Building a life that lasts and a church that lasts and a marriage and a family that lasts is very intentional. And so over the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at different building blocks that we need in our life to build a life that lasts. And to get the first building block for this week, I want you to go to Hebrews, the first chapter. Hebrews 1 starting in verse 1 the Bible says long ago at many times and in many ways God spoke to our fathers by the prophets but in these last days he has spoken to us by his son whom he appointed the heir of all things through whom through Jesus also he created the world. Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. Let me just stop right there. Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of the Father's nature. The, the, Jesus told his disciples, he says, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Why? Because we're one. When you hear me speak, you're hearing the Father speak. When you see me act, you're seeing the Father act. I'm not doing anything willy-nilly here. I am following the exact pattern that the Father has laid out for me. I am the exact imprint of his nature. You want to know what God is like? Look at me because, by the way, I am God. That, that, that is a foundational truth that we need to understand, that Jesus is God. He's not a created being that ascended to a super spiritual level. He is God who has always existed that took on flesh to dwell among his people. And I've had people challenge me on that. Like, well, and I, my answer is read the Bible. The Bible is very clear on who Jesus is. In the beginning, let's go to John 1. And you don't have to turn there. I'm saying in the beginning was what? The word. The Word was with God, and the Word, what? Was God. If you skip down a few verses, it tells us something. The Word, tell them that Jesus is talking. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. If that's your phone, I'm not upset by that at all. <laughs> Honestly. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. You skip down, it says, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus is the always existing God. He is the third member of the Trinity. We have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, who make one God. Are you following me so far? So it says... It is through Jesus that the world was created. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. He upholds. Jesus upholds the universe by the word of his power. Grasp that. The entire universe is being held together by his word. Every molecule is coming into proper place because of his word. In the beginning, when he spoke, let there be light, all of the things that are needed for light showed up because he spoke. But what I'm wanting you to see is if God is holding the entire universe together by his word, who else is being held together by his word? We are. Our life, our purpose, our call. Our destiny, everything is being held together by his word. So when this passage started, it said, at many times, in many ways, God spoke to us by the prophets. But now he speaks to us by the son. The, the prophet was a very essential part to the nation of Israel. They are the person who spoke God's word to 
God's people. If you wanted to know back then what God was saying, you had to have a prophet in your midst. And your ability to thrive was directly connected to your willingness to listen to the prophet because they were speaking the word of God. They were not the source of the word, but they were the carrier or the messenger that was bringing the word to the people. But when Jesus steps on the scene, he's not saying things like, thus saith the Lord. So that was prophetic language. Your prophets in the Old Covenant, they would say things like, thus saith the Lord. Why? Because they're not the source. They're just delivering what the source is saying. So God is saying right now. But when Jesus arrives, he doesn't say, thus saith the Lord. He says, I say unto you. Why? He's showing that he has the authority of the word of God. And the same way that we would follow the voice of the prophet, we need to follow the voice of Jesus because now he is the great prophet, the word of God himself in flesh who directs our life. So when we look at the first building block, this is very important. The first building block that we have to establish in our life is his word. Somebody say his word. His word is the foundation that we have to build our life on. There's a parable where Jesus is talking about two men building a house. Y'all familiar with that parable? And he says there's two guys building a house. Man A decides to build his house on a foundation of sand. Man B decides he's going to build his house on a foundation of rock. So they build their homes, one on sand one on rock they get the house established it's painted it's looking good i don't know what kind of elevation they had on that home you know i grew up in a pink house did you know that it has nothing to do with the sermon but just wanting you to know some of my trauma in life (laughs) like when the pizza guy you know would say our address and he'd be like where's that it's the pink house on the jack road okay gotcha (laughs) but One man built his house on the sand, one man builds his house on the rock. Jesus says, when the storm comes, okay, the storm comes for both homes. I want you to understand that. There is no way to live a life void of storms. Storms will come, trials will come. If you ever hear someone preaching saying, if you're truly a Christian, you'll never face a trial, run. Because you're listening to someone who's never read scripture. Jesus himself, who is God, faced trials. He faced pressure. He experienced storms on all kinds of levels. So he says, when the storm comes, somebody say when. When When the storm comes, the house that is built on the sand is going to fall. But the house that is built on the rock, it is going to stand. Then he takes the extra step to let us know a little more about the foundations he's talking about he says the man who built his house on the sand listen to what I'm going to say to you this is important the man who built his house on the sand is the person who hears my words but does nothing with them in other words the person who builds their life on the sand is the person who shows up to church who reads their Bible, who hears the sermon, but does nothing with it. There's no application. But the man who builds his life on the rock is the one who, when he hears my words, he applies them. And so since he has applied my word, he's on a firm foundation. So when the storm comes and beats on his house, he stands. Are you seeing how important the word of God is in our life to build a firm foundation? But it's not just hearing and reading, it is doing. Faith without works is what? Dead. It is useless to study scripture if you're not going to apply the scripture you've studied. Stop wasting your time with a devotion in the morning if you're not going to apply what the word is saying. That is ignorance. That is foolishness. 
The point of studying Scripture is not to gain head knowledge. The point of studying Scripture is to receive the Word of God so that I can start building my life on it, applying it. There are two keys in life that make everything within the kingdom work for you. Now, there are many things that work in and around these two keys, but these two keys are essential. The first is faith. Someone say faith. The Bible says without faith, it is impossible to please God. Those that come to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. So no faith, no pleasure. We have to have faith. We have to be a people of faith. Somebody say faith. But the second one that goes hand in hand with faith is this word obedience. People love to talk about how great their faith is. But we, we hear very little about how obedient they are. Don't, don't tell me about your faith. Let me see your obedience. Because if I see your obedience, I'll know you've got some faith. I think that's somewhere in the scripture. Probably in James. Yeah, I think he talks about, don't, don't tell me, show me. If you have faith, I'll see it in action. Why? Because a person of faith hears what God says and immediately applies it. It is the foundation they build their life on. It is the foundation that they understand is true. And apart from God's word, there is no truth. And here's the thing about truth. Sometimes it's painful. Sometimes the truth is uncomfortable. But the truth is always beneficial. I want to say that again because I, I, I understand as a human being just like you that read scripture, there are things that I read that are very uncomfortable at times. There are things that I have read in scripture that challenge my vehicle of flesh. But I have to make up my mind, am I going to live by my will or am I going to live according to his word? That doesn't mean I'm going to get it all right all the time, but I am moving in the direction of his word. And that's when you know you're on the right track. If, if you mess up and you are aware that you mess up and you try to move back towards what God is saying, you're good to go. That's what repentance is. It's a change of mind. It's a turning. Okay? But if you're just in your head, hey, what I got and what I do is okay and I'm going to keep on doing it and God's okay with it too, that's when you start stepping into error. We live in a world today that is filled with people who want to know their own truth, who want to find their own truth. And their truth is leading them towards destruction. I don't know a more loving way to, to let you know that. That just because it feels good or seems right to you, if it is not truth based on God's word, it's going to lead you in a very dangerous spot so our life is built on his foundation because his word is true somebody say it's true his word has the ability to lead me into life because it directs my path i'm wanting you to see what the word his word does for you somebody say it directs me the bible says thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. What does that mean? When I get into the word of God, he begins to illuminate some things for me. He starts showing me where to walk and how to walk it out. Now a sign that I am a child of God is that I am following that voice. Jesus says in the book of John, the 14th chapter, he says, my sheep know my voice and a voice of the other they will not follow. So a sign that you are a follower of Christ is that you are following his voice. Again, that doesn't mean you get it right all the time because you still got flesh. You're still subject to slip up and mess up. But the sign that you are a child of God is that you are trying to hear his voice and follow his voice. And as you follow his voice, it leads you into life. Why? Because it's truth. Somebody say it's truth. So his word gives me direction. His word will direct 
relationships, his word will direct marriages, his word will direct how you do business. His word will give you wisdom for finances. Every aspect of your life, his word has a truth that you can apply that will be beneficial to you. you again, you may not like what it says, but the proof is in the pudding. When you start applying the word of God, it will produce in your life. I've always said it this way. The word of God works. We just have to learn how to work it. The word of God works. We just have to learn how to work it through our faith and through our obedience. The next thing I want you to see is that the word sanctifies you. Somebody say sanctify. That's a big word for basically meaning sets you apart, cleans you up. The Bible says in the book of John 17, 17, Jesus is praying to the Father before his crucifixion. He's praying and he says, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. So in other, in other words, sanctify them in your word because your word has the power to do for them what they cannot do for themselves. One of the greatest changes I have seen in my life is the power of the word of God in operation. I grew up in church. There are probably very few people in this room or watching online that have been in, in as many church services as I have been in my life. Big Rich may be the only person in here that can even understand what it, what it is to be at church three times on a Sunday, again on a Monday, and again on a Wednesday all your life. And when you got sick, your dad said, get up, we're going to church, but I'm sick. Well, Jesus is a healer, come on. I remember one time we were in church for one month straight. One month straight. Sometimes we were doing double services on the same night. So we would get one service started and immediately leave and go to another service. There was a stretch in my life to where we would minister on a Sunday morning, get in a car, drive to Asheville, North Carolina, and do church in Asheville, North Carolina that night. What I'm trying to say is I've been around church a long time. And I've seen everything that you can um, possibly imagine and everything that you would say is a move of God. I've seen it happen. I've experienced it. And nothing has changed my life more than his word. Right. See, many times we want this like physical experience in church. And I'm not against any of this, okay? But we want this physical experience. But I'm telling you, the physical experience separated from his word will do nothing. You will jump and shout and leave the same way until you say, His word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And so, God, if you've said it, I'm going to walk it out. And so when I started getting into Scripture and allowing it to rub me a little bit, because it did, I started seeing things that I was doing that I thought was okay my whole life. And I started saying, oh, my goodness, <laughs> You know, and I started leaning into the word of God. The word itself cleaned me. Right. I didn't have to clean myself. See, understand, this is how Christianity works. Every other religion is you get better and try to ascend to God. That's not Christianity. Christianity is you're so bad that God had to come to you. And since you can't fix you, he died for you so that you could become like him. So it is Jesus who cleanses you. It is Jesus through his word that prunes you. It is Jesus through his word and the power of his spirit that sanctifies you and makes you more like him. Are you following this? So it's not as much a struggle and an effort as it is a resting and a relaxing in what he has done and what he has said. And the more I'll gravitate towards looking at what he has said and allowing it to feed my spirit and praying, God, let your word illuminate my path. Show me what I need to see. See, when I read scripture, I'm not just trying to meet a quota. I'm not just trying to get my badge on, on you version. I, I am reading to be fed. And so I'll pray, God, feed me with your word. Let me see what I need to see today. Because I understand not only has he already spoken to us through the scripture, but the scripture continues to speak today because the scripture is not words on a page. It is Jesus Christ himself. And so when you open it up, he begins to speak.
to you. Have you ever experienced that before? You see a passage, you're reading it, and as you're reading it, he starts speaking to you. He starts leading you. He starts guiding you. He starts working on you. The Bible says that his word is living and active. Think about that. It is living and active sharper than a two-edged sword. It discerns the hearts and the thoughts and the intentions of man. It's, it's working on you. It's the only book in the world that will work on you as you read it. Why? Because it's living. Why is it living? Because it's not a book. It's a man. Are you seeing this, church? It's not just a book. It is a Man, it is the revelation of Jesus Christ himself given by him to the world. He is the word of God that became flesh and dwelt among us. Why did he do that? To direct us and lead us into a place of abundance, a place of eternal life. He is the good shepherd that leads and guides. How does he lead and guide? Through his word, my sheep know my voice, and another they will not listen to. My interest as a pastor is not to build a large congregation. I want you to know my heart. I love it when the church is full, and we're going to grow. I know that. But my heart is not to just build a large congregation. My heart is to build individuals, to partner with you so that you and I at the same time can start building lives that last to where we truly become a demonstration of what it looks like to be the church to the world because I believe we have fallen short. When I say we, I'm not talking about us in this room, I'm talking about the church globally. I really believe that we have fallen short on demonstrating who Jesus Christ is and what he does. We've gotten so caught up in ideas. We've gotten so caught up in our traditions. We've got so caught up in the box of what a move of God is that we're missing what God is wanting to do. And it starts with discipleship. I've seen people jump up and down in church and leave and do the same thing they've been doing their whole life. So obviously that's not it. Again, I'm not against that. But what speaks louder to me is the life that comes in and goes, Jesus, it is your word. It is your work. And it is your will in my life. And we spend our entire life investigating who Jesus is. Because he's the target that we're trying to become like. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And if we don't get into his word, we develop shallow Christians. If we don't get into his word, we develop churches that are run by ideas and not his spirit. We get into churches that are run by programs and not his presence. And I don't want that. I don't want any part of that. I want to be a part of his church where he is the head. He is the leader. He is the voice that is speaking to us. Does he use messengers still? Yeah. Does he use people as vessels? Yes. But I want to make sure that the source is good. And not, not a man. Are you hearing what? I'm just trying to share my heart. That's why I'm going into this series when we're talking about built to last, talking about these, these fundamental things that are so foundational to us. The, the importance of knowing the word, knowing who Jesus is, knowing what he's done, and knowing what he is still wanting to do. Because people don't know. People do not know. If I ask some of you today, what do you got to do to be saved? I would get a whole variety of answers in here. I've asked this question. I've gotten answers like, read your Bible. And I'm like, man, that's a really great place to start, but that's not what saves you. People have told me, well, go to church. 
<laughs> Man, that's a really great thing to do, but that doesn't save you. Well, be a good person. Man, we should really all strive to be good people, but that doesn't save you. You know, help people who are in need. Yeah, we should help people who are in need, but that does not save you. Are you hearing what I'm saying? There is only one who can save you, and that is Jesus Christ. By coming to him and saying, it is your word, it is your will, it is your work in my life, and I surrender to you. I want to be like you. I am brokenhearted of who I am in my flesh. I am grieved with my thoughts. I am grieved by my actions, and I know I can't fix me, and so I come to you. It's more than, listen, hear me, it is more than just trying to make it to heaven. I asked someone the other day, like, why would you give your life to Jesus? Well, because I want to go to heaven. That's a very shallow answer. Of course we all want to go to heaven. That's a great, that's a much better alternative, right? But it's more than just trying to make it to heaven. It is understanding what he did for us, even though we didn't deserve it. He did not have to save us. He did not have to go through the pain of the cross. He did not have to shed his blood. He could have just wiped humanity off the face of the earth. He didn't need us. You know, people say, well, God created people because he needed relationship. No, he didn't. God did not need you. He had perfect relationship within himself, the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. They communicated with one another. They loved one another. They were in perfect harmony. He did not create you because he needed something from you. He created you because he desired to create people in his image that would carry his nature on this planet that he's created. And then we screwed it up real big and bad. You understand that? And we turned the authority that he gave us over to Satan himself. And the only way to fix that was for Jesus to come, the perfect spotless lamb, who lived the life that we could not live, so that he could die the death that we deserve, so that we could have new life in him. He takes back the authority. He makes everything right. And so now I, I, when I look at that, I look at it in amazement, and I still look at it going, I, have, I still don't comprehend. I, I, don't comp- I, God, I can't comprehend what you did. Why you did why'd you do that? Why for, for me? Why for me? Why would you die for me? And it's because he's a loving, faithful God who doesn't give up. He, do, he doesn't give up on you. Some of you in the room, you think that when you mess up, he gives up on you and you've got to fix yourself to get back to him. That's not how it works. Jesus is not stiff-arming you. He's got arms wide open going, come unto me. Come to me. Find rest in me. I will work for you. I've done the work for you. I shed my blood for you. You don't have to live in shame and condemnation because I did the work. These are things that we have to know. Because if not, we've got churches full of people who are living in condemnation. And maybe some of you in here today, you're living with that whole thing of condemnation because every time you screw up, you think you've got to fix it and, you know, and then you're, you're never good enough and, you know, I can't serve in the church until I get this right. That's, that's garbage. If we're all waiting to be perfect before we serve, this would be an empty building. I wouldn't even be here. Do you understand that I'm not a perfect human being? I have attitude problems sometimes. I have wrong thoughts sometimes. I say the wrong things sometimes. I'm a human being just like you. Who is trying to surrender myself to his word. His work. And his will, because that's what true salvation is. It's not just saying a prayer. See, some of you think I'm going to heaven because I said a prayer one day. But what does that prayer say? If you believe in your heart that Jesus died on the cross and was risen from the dead, and you confess with your mouth that Jesus is what? Lord, you will be saved. Are you, are you following that train of thought? I believe what he did, and now I'm confessing you're my Lord, which means I'm coming under your authority. I'm living according to your word and your truth and not what I think. 
when you are saved, you will see fruit. And the fact that you are grieved over the things you do wrong when you do them is a good sign that you are saved. Because that's the conviction of the Holy Spirit saying, come on back, come on back, come on back. We're going to build lives that last. We're going to be a banner to this city of what it looks like to be the church of Jesus Christ. I believe that people are going to be able to identify us as we're out in the community. They're going to be like, you must be a part of that activation church because you're a little bit different than everybody else. Not weird. I'm not looking for weird. I've, I've done weird, okay? <laughs> We've got a section for all the weird people here. It's in the back right-hand corner. If you turn around, you can see the weird people standing up in the back. There they are. All the weird ones wave. Yep, there they are right there. Most of you are on the worship team. That's weird. <laughs> Not weird, but different in a good way, where it's like people actually see our love. When somebody does us wrong, we respond different. How about that? Hmm? Yeah. That we forgive. Mm -hmm. That we don't hold someone's past against them. You know, I, I'm, I'm stepping into a, a different realm right now, but some of you need to hear this because the church has been really good at finding the guilty and smashing their teeth up against the curb. Yeah, that's true. We've been really good at finding the smoothest stone that we can throw the fastest at the person who's done wrong. And that's not Jesus. Jesus is the one who finds the person who's done wrong and gets down with them. The only one who has the right to cast the stone gets down and says, I'm not here to cast stones. I'm here to restore you. Go and sin no more. He doesn't say, hey, it's okay. Keep on doing what you're doing. Grace is enough. That's not what he says. That's, that's another place that we get really messed up with because we don't understand grace. Grace is not freedom to do whatever you want. Grace is freedom to not be you anymore. And so Jesus comes alongside of us and he says, I'm not here to condemn you. I'm here to lift you up. I'm here to love you. I'm here to partner with you, to move you in the right direction. I really wish that we could be that way. Because as long as we cast people away, we're going to spend the rest of our life throwing out gifted people that God would use for his kingdom to do mighty things. Listen, do, when, when we sin, should there be repentance? Yes. But there's also got to be a time of healing, and the Bible says restoration. And we've missed that. We've missed that part of restoration, especially in the church. We are the only group of people that kills their generals when they do wrong. Y'all even know what I'm talking about? Men of God that have been used by God, they fall because they're a man just like anyone else. And instead of allowing a process of restoration, we cast them out and say, you're worthless. You're a scumbag. You are nothing. I better stop. Father, forgive us for the things that we've done wrong. Lord, we know that we are not perfect. And God, I know that I am not perfect. I know that I am subject to error. But God, I thank you for your faithfulness and your love and your kindness that wants to restore, that wants to make things new. And so today, God, I'm asking that you will begin to move in the hearts and lives of your people to make us look like you, to make us sound like you so that we can move like you god we are your hands and feet here on this earth people need healing and they're going to receive that healing through us because it is christ in us that is the hope of glory well that's the end of our online experience but listen your journey is not over we believe that god has a purpose a plan and a destiny just for you and we've put together some resources here on our youtube channel that we believe will help you step into that future he has for you. So take a moment, look around, let us know what you think. And if you have a prayer request, please send it to info at activationonline.org because we would love to pray with you. Well, until next week, have a wonderful day.